am a professional fundraiser. Which is why, if you'll check under your seat right now, you'll find this year's giving pledge. If everyone in the audience pledges $1,000 tonight, then together we can fund my trip to Italy. Because I'm tired of sitting in my room because of COVID. I'm just kidding. Who would want to give to that? I mean, I don't know you, you don't know me, and my cause sounds vaguely fake. Although I can assure you, a $100,000 budget would not cover my gelato costs. <laughs> In the fundraising world, we call that transactional fundraising, and really good fundraisers try to stay away from it. But our businesses don't. Our businesses are enthralled with efficiency. And I don't think it's malicious, I just think that they think they'll make more money that way. The other day, I needed to talk to my doctor about a non-emergency question, and in order to reach her, I have to call her office which then uh, gives me a long series of automated voice messages where I press seven, then two, then three, which gives me the great joy of leaving a voicemail with her nurse. And if my question is good enough, then that nurse calls me back 24 to 48 hours later, and if it's not good enough, then I never hear from them. But I do get their monthly newsletter email telling me the four best ways to cure a sore throat. Have you experienced a business like that lately? A business that you either really need or really love that is treating you less like a person and more and more like a get in, get out transaction. I know you have. I get 100 emails at 8 a.m. every day too. But fundraisers for nonprofits, those super sweet people who are doing such good work for your community but no, do not invite them over for dinner because who knows what campaign they're pushing. Yes, those people. They have a really compelling argument that your business would make more money and your customers would be happier if you cared less about getting people in and out quickly, those short-term transactions, and cared more about keeping the customers that you already have. Good relational fundraisers, what we're going to call them are GRIFs. There we go. GRIFs. Good relational fundraisers. They are people who have been fundraisers for 20, 30, or 40 years, and they are fascinating. Uh, they have something to teach us. A griff that I know had a donor who gave a million dollars to her organization, a real $1 million check that they handed over, and that donor at the end of the process said, thank you. Thank you for letting us do this. It has been a life-changing experience, and we are so thankful. We can't wait to keep giving to your organization after giving $1 million. Baffling. That is like hiring a babysitter, and at the end of the night, the babysitter being like, wow, what a treat it was to change your baby's diapers and to put them to bed kicking and screaming, right? It doesn't happen. When was the last time someone thanked you or your business because they had such a delightful experience when you were just doing your job? So how do they do this? How do GRIFs build a long-term, mutually beneficial relationship with their donors? The, the GRIF success flows from how they think about their donor. First, the GRIF assumes that the donor will like giving, which is a radically optimistic viewpoint of humans, right? In a world where nobody can get enough money and we're all just trying to amass more of it, GRIFs believe that you will like giving it away. But it's true. In 2017, the University of Zurich did a study where they watched the brain and they tracked the brain when you gave or if you even thought about giving. And the brain lights up in all these different areas and dopamine is released. And so giving literally makes you happier. But Chris also know that you won't know where to start. Who was the last person that you talked to about the real state of your bank account in hard numbers? For many of my donors, I am the third person ever, and many of them are in their 60s. They've talked to a spouse, a parent, or a mentor, and maybe a financial advisor, and that's it. Money is like sex and death. Even if it's okay to post on social media about it, it is not okay to talk about. A couple years ago, my mom had to put our family dog down, and it was terrible timing. Not that it's ever good timing because uh, my little four-year-old niece, they had just had to put their family dog down too. And so the first time my niece comes over to my mom's house, she says, where's Sammy? And my mom says, well, Sammy's in the same place that Junior is. 
thinking that my sister had done the whole farm why thing. And uh, so my four-year-old niece looks at my mom and says, so he's dead? And weirdly enough, that is what griffs do for their donors. They take the, all of the awkwardness of the situation onto their shoulders, and they ask the hard questions about money that no one wants to ask. What do you care about? What do you want to give your money to? What financial legacy do you want to leave? And soon enough, that relationship between Griff and donor becomes a delight. It becomes a relief to the donor because they can finally talk about this thing that's a daily stressor in their lives. The second thing that Griffs assume about their donors is that the donor has a complex, intricate personal life. Griffs know that they're not your BFF like your other BFFs, but they do like you. In fact, they have a hard time not liking you. Whenever you ask them, whenever a Griff asks you, you know, what financial legacy do you want to leave, and you tell them all about your Aunt Amy, who lives this incredible life of generosity, and you care about giving because of her, they don't just shut their ears and yell la 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 and don't care. They care. A Griff that I know did her master's thesis on what happens to donor retention whenever you ask open-ended questions in a nonprofit. So essentially, she tried to track what happens whenever I ask someone a question and then shut up and listen. And what she found is in this organization, they took away all opportunities for personal dialogue and open-ended discussion, and donor retention plummeted. Dr. Terry O'Connor proved that there's a connection between donor retention and asking people questions. Griffs care about your personal life. In fact, they care about it so much that they're willing to reject some research that we have on giving. A group from the University of Virginia Psychology Department um, tracked giving, and they wondered, uh, will more people give if there's an uncertain event going on in their life? And they found that yes, if you've just had a job interview, or if you just are awaiting results from a cancerous biopsy, that you are more likely to give. This situation is ripe for transactional fundraisers to take advantage of. But Griffs don't care so much about this year's gift, they care about the next 10 years of giving. And so if a Griff wants you to give for 30 years, you'll probably end up giving for 25 out of those 30 with five years of uncertain events coming up, and the Griff won't even ask you to give those years because they understand what's going on in your personal life. Which is still better than asking someone to give the year that their wife just got cancer and they give one gift until they were taken, they realized they were taken advantage of. Griffs care about donors' personal life because they know that their business is tied to it. And if I'm being super honest, most Griffs just like most people. Griffs are people, people trying to help people. Clear enough, right? So, at this point in the talk, you're like, Abby, show me the money. You promised me that I acted more like a Griff and my business would make more money. So prove it. Okay, I'll prove it. Here is the golden nugget. Donor retention, donor retention, donor retention. We have a rule in fundraising called the 90-10 rule or 80-20 or 70-30. It says that 90% of your budget comes in from 10% of your donors or 80% from 20% or 70% from 30%, depending on your donor breakdown. And I would bet that most businesses, if they looked at their customer database, would see a self-identified group of people who love their business and have said, I'm willing to buy multiple of your products. And our businesses are just ignoring them. Whereas Griffs go in and get to know that 10%, really figure out why they're giving, and ask them to give year after year after year. And so then 90% of their budget comes in year after year after year. For context, $470 billion were given away in the United States in 2020. $320 billion of that coming from individuals not from corporations or foundations. It's amazing. And I can guarantee you that the majority of that $320 billion went to Griffs. I'm gonna end with one last story. And this is a dorky history story, so nobody knows it. So this is brand new to everyone. And um, it shows what happens when a Griff really does care about their donor. 
In the 1850s-ish, in a little town right outside of Florence, Italy, a group of people decided to remodel a house. It was this big, beautiful Italian villa that some rich guy had lived in that everyone had forgotten. And they decide to move a stairwell, and they start busting out these walls, and behind these walls, they find huge canvas bags full of letters and financial documents written to a guy named Francesco Dettini, who was one of the world's wealthiest people in the 1300s. He had an unbelievable amount of money, which does not explain why he did not hire a better artist to paint a more beautiful picture of him. But that's okay. This would be like finding Jeff Bezos's personal USB drive 400 years from now. That's how exciting it was in the history community. And so when you read these letters between Francesco and his wife and Francesco and his best friend, a guy named Sir Lapa Ponce, you see this portrait painted of a man who's growing increasingly regretful. As his wealth grows and as his merchant empire grows, he becomes paranoid and frustrated and regretful at this thing that he's built. I mean, at one point, he cheats on his wife, has an illegitimate daughter, panics, give her, gives her up to the local hospital for that hospital to raise, regrets it a couple years later, goes and tries to find the daughter, finds the daughter, and then raises her as his own, right? He is trapped by what he's built. Until finally, Lapo, his best friend, starts writing some letters to him, and it's like, Francesco, get rid of this thing that is killing you. Give some money to the poor, to, to the poor. change your will, do something good with this money. And Francesco doesn't do it right away, you know, there are letters... Talking about this topic 10 to 15 years apart. But finally, Francesco starts to give some money away through Lapo to this servant who's having a hard time or this person who just lost his wife. Until finally, at the end of his life, Francesco Dettini dictates the most audaciously generous will that the world has ever seen and that I think the world may ever see. In his will, he breaks up his empire, he sells all of his assets, he funnels all of this money into one source, one charity that he created that still exists today. And remember that illegitimate daughter that he had, that he gave up to a hospital? Well, in his will, he set aside a certain amount of money to build the first state-run orphanage. And this orphanage... Uh, opened its doors in 1445 and closed them in 1980. So that's the same amount of time between Christopher Columbus and Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. Wow. Hundreds and thousands of Italian children were saved because Francesco Dettini started talking to Lapo about his wealth, and guess who he dictated that? Uh, his will to to Lapo himself, who was the man who was put in charge of making all making sure that all these things happened. And so that orphanage lasted until 1980, until it became a museum and then a research library where a little American girl decided that she should write her thesis and remembered that that was a pretty cool looking building and wanted to know more. I care about Griffs because our world is enamored with reaching millions, right? We are enamored with selling things quickly. Email and social media are fickle. They tell us that we can get rich quick and that we can reach millions. But in reaching for millions, we seem to forget the individuals that make up those millions. I wish that our world didn't care so much about money, but it does, we all know that. And so I feel at least obligated to tell you that you'll make just as much money caring about your customers as you do caring about efficiency. In fact, you may even make more of it. You are incentivized to value other people. You are incentivized to value other people. Our capitalist money world world will thank you for your great profits that quarter and will ask you how you did it. I know it sounds backwards and crazy, but if we stop bemoaning our customers and their inefficiencies, if we pump our new great COVID technology into real human connection and not getting people in and out a little bit quicker, then your organization will thrive. And I don't know about you, but I would love to see a world 
where our journalists and our college administrators and our retailers and our doctors and our dentists cared for the people that they worked with and worked for and saw them as people. People who have a complex, intricate personal life who are trying to do something good with what they have. Business relationships are valuable. And you can only gain long-term, authentic business relationships by caring for the people around you and believing in your customer as an independent, capable human being. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs>